Hi, everyone. Welcome to Human Stories. Uh, my name is Arsalan Khan. I'm an assistant professor uh, of anthropology at Union College in upstate New York. Um, I'm a sociocultural anthropologist that studies Islam, um, secularism, and modernity. Um, and today I'm going to talk about my research um, on the Islamic piety movement, the Tablighi Jamaat, um, and their understanding of Islamic piety and, um, and their understanding of moral order in Pakistan. Um, the Pakistani Tablighis, uh, practitioners of the transnational Islamic piety movement, the Tablighi Jamaat, can be seen traveling through Pakistan's villages, towns, and cities in groups of 10 or 12 men dressed in shalwar kameez, their pant legs raised above their ankles, wearing the Muslim uh, skull cap, the topi, and bearing long flowing beards, an image that is immediately discernible um, as an iconic representation of the Prophet. The Bligis are committed to a distinct form of face-to-face -face preaching, Dabat that they see as a duty of all Muslims and a necessary basis for the spread of Islamic virtue. Towards this end, they travel for specified periods of time from mosque to mosque and house to house, inviting, the literal meaning of the word Dabat, inviting, fellow Muslims to the mosque to pray and listen to sermons with the ultimate aim of getting them to commit to Dabat. The Bligis insist that their method of preaching follows the Prophet's example and therefore, like all of the Prophet's actions, is divinely inspired. This commitment to their own form of, of, of preaching, Dawud, places Tablighis at odds and sometimes even in conflict with a range of other Islamic actors, uh, from Islamist political parties to corporations to NGOs, that all claim to be advancing the cause of Islam in Pakistan. Tablighis, however, insist that only their own activities are properly religious, authentically religious, and that these other Islamic actors conflate religion, deen, and the world, dunya, and therefore fail to spread Islamic virtue. In this talk, I, uh, I, in this presentation, I would like to share with you um, some, some of my observations about the Tabligi Jamaat, their understanding of religion, um, their understanding of preaching, and how they enter into a complex, diverse field uh, of Islamic actors in Pakistan. Um, and I will also address how uh, understanding the diversity of religious movements help us, helps us challenge um, reductive understandings of religion and reductive understandings of Islam that shape, um, is, uh, that are integral to Islamophobia um, and shape our, our understandings of, of the relationship in religion and violence. So Tablighi Jamaat was founded in the 1920s by Muhammad Ilyas, an alim or Islamic scholar trained in the Darul Uloom Madrasa in the town of Deoband in North India. Historians of South Asia placed the Tablighi Jamaat with, within, the, uh, within the broader parameters of what they called Islamic reform, an effort to purify Islamic life of corruptions and oppressions understood to have developed through long contact between Muslims and non-Muslims, particularly Hindus, and to revive the original Islam of the Quran uh, and the prophetic tradition. So the Tablighi Jamaat fits into a broader project of reforming and reviving what they think to be the original Islam of the Quran. So it's all about a kind of return to that original Islam. Um, today, the Tablighi Jamaat is considered by many scholars uh, to be one of the largest and fastest growing Islamic movements in the world, with millions of adherents. Um, this is evidenced by the hundreds of thousands or millions of attendees to the annual congregations that happen in major cities across the world. Um, I'll just share with you a few images that I took from a Karachi congregation. This annually, um, Tablighis from all across the country and across the world congregate in various cities across South Asia, um, as well as one in England, Dewsbury, England. Um, and here, these congregations are, are hosted in a vast tent city that is impossible to capture in a single image, but you can see it's a sort of dense um, populated, densely populated space. And the Bleas, um spend three days here um, listening to sermons given by the elders of the movement, praying together, eating together, sleeping in the same space and kind of uh and and they're 
they believe that this is sort of especially meritorious um, event. So what is the Tablighi Jamaat about? Okay, Tablighi say that Muslims have abandoned religion and have been distracted by the world. And this has thrust the world into a state of moral chaos. Okay? Well, chaos is manifested in all manner of problems, but mostly, and this is very important in a country like Pakistan, but mostly as conflict among Muslims, whether within families, between ethnic communities, and between Muslim Muslims. So Muslims, they say, are, are not at peace with one another. Muslims are not able to connect with each other. And, and part of the reason, or Part of the reason, the primary reason for this is because Muslims have abandoned um, religious practice. How to get Muslims back to religious practice? Well, this is the central point of the Tabligi Jamaat movement. And the central claim is that Dawud, their particular mode of preaching, is not only for the benefit of others. That is, you don't just preach to others for their benefit, but instead it is crucially for the reform or correction of the tabligi himself. Okay. Dawat tabligi say is designed to grow one's own faith and create in the tabligi the passion and desire to fulfill his or her religious duties. Tablighis explained to me that by giving Dawat, that is preaching the virtues of a specific practice to others, this led, created, this sort of gave birth to the desire for that specific practice. And so one of the things that the Muslims do when they go house to house preaching the merits of Islam, preaching the importance of Islam practice, is they also convey to the listener the importance of Dawud itself. Because they say Dawud is the mother of practices. And what they mean by that is that it literally gives birth to the desire for other Islam practices. But Dawud is not any practice. Right? It is the Ligis regard what the Tabis regard as a sacred practice. And as a sacred practice, it must abide by certain conditions. Okay. First condition is that Dawat must be conducted in a face-to-face or as Tablighi say, heart to heart manner. Okay. are insistent that while you can use mass media like television and radio to remind people of Islam. These mediums are not effective ways to con- convey Islamic, the Islamic message. They're not con- effective ways to connect Muslims to each other and to thus best- cultivate virtues in the heart, either of the listener or of the preacher. So what the Bligis insist is that you must go from house to house, you must sit in mosque, and it's that physical presence with each other that really has the transformative power to to connect Muslims to each other. Okay. Second that we say, and this goes along with the first one, is that Dawud requires sacrifice for Bani. And it requires sacrifice in, t- in three forms, physical energy or life force, jan, wealth, mal, and time, wakt. And what this means, that what the Bligis do is that they, they commit their own time and their own resources and of course their own bodily uh, life force um, to the practice of Dabba. So you're supposed to pay your own way, you're supposed to give your own time, and you're supposed to commit your body to Dabba. And it's by committing the body, again, that one's self-transformation happens, but also that God is pleased with you by your sacrifice, and therefore God imbues your words with power. And as he imbues your words with power, they have this transformative effect. Third, Dawud is a collective practice okay, rather than just an individual practice, which means that it draws its force from being conducted in a group. This is why Tablighis travel in groups, because in the group, uh, there's a sort of different power than if you were to do this on your own. So in practice, what this means, these three rules of Islamic practice, uh, Dabat as an Islamic practice mean, um, in anthropology, we call these felicity conditions. These are the conditions under which Dabat acquires its efficacy as a ritual practice. Um, what this means is that the Bhagis travel and live together in mosques in order to preach the virtues of Islamic practice to fellow Muslims. 
the close proximate living between Muslims is said to produce ties between them that are based on the good. Okay? Hence, Dawat is the basis for forging a genuine Islam. They say Muslims come to stand together on the good in this practice. Through this practice, we come to forge a community. And so the Tablighi community, the congregation, becomes a microcosm of the Islamic community writ large, and it becomes the agent of creating a, 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 an Islamic community throughout Pakistan and throughout, throughout the world. And in creating this Islamic community, they say that Dawat is the condition for moral, spiritual, and economic well-being, political and economic well-being, right? That, that all the problems that Muslims face in the world can be resolved if Muslims are to come to Islam properly. Okay. Now, Pakistan is a, a, an interesting place to study. The Bliki Jamaat is a transnational movement, of course, um, and it has, uh, has a presence through, uh, throughout the world, but especially in other South Asian countries. But Pakistan is a particularly interesting uh, country to study. As Pakistan was conceived um, and founded as a homeland for the Muslims of the Indian subcontinent, um, it was based on uh, what we call the two nation theory that posited that the Hindus and the Muslims of the Indian subcontinent were fundamentally distinct people uh, with distinct religious and cultural traditions. And that basically that the idea was that Muslims, the, the, the Pakistan movement's claim was that Muslims could not live um, freely as a minority in a Hindu dominated India. Now, Despite the, some of the ostensibly secular dispositions of Pakistan's founding father, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Islam remained central to conceptions of national identity from Pakistan's conception. But it was only really in the 1980s that Pakistan moved kind of uh, in the direction of, of really establishing Islamic, the link between Islam um, and state. State party. So Islamist political parties like the Jamaat -e Islami had long argued that Pakistan must move, must move in the direction of Islamic ideals um, and become an Islamic state, but their abilities to realize this goal had remained limited in the first decade after independence. It was in the, under the military dictatorship of General Ziaul Haq from 1977 to 1988 that formalized and intensified the link between Islam and the state, making Islam the basis for state sovereignty. Since then, Pakistan has witnessed the proliferation of Islamic forces, from new political parties to sectarian organizations, to Islamic banks, corporations, NGOs, new educational institutes, televangelists and lay preachers, all who, who all claim to be creating the basis uh, for an Islamic society. Basically, claims to Islamic legitimacy and authority are ubiquitous in Pakistan. And the Bliqi Jamaat is only one actor in this very contested and complex movement. Yet the Bliqis, despite the fact that Islam seems to be everywhere in Pakistan, the Bliqis insist that all of these Islamic forces misunderstand religion and conflate religion with the world and therefore fail to spread Islamic virtue and fail to create an Islamic community. It is only Dawud, they say, that really brings Muslims properly to Islam. Okay, so I, what I study is the sort of micro practices, the micro elements that go into the making of an Islamic community in the practice of teaching. That's my primary focus. Um, so, you know, what are some of my main findings? Well, the Bliqis understand themselves to be cultivating, I, I, I learned, they're cultivating a pious masculine self that they believe to be unlike the hard uh, hard masculinity that they associate with public life in Pakistan. They believe they are cultivating a more a softer masculinity um, that makes the Muslim capable of being caring uh, in the domestic sphere towards parents, spouses, and wife, children, as well as in the public sphere towards fellow Muslims and even not. So they believe they're creating a sort of new paradigm of being a pious male like the prophet that allows for both a kind of respect for one's 
people who are higher up than oneself in a hierarchy, like religious authorities, parents, elders, okay, and lower down. And because it's a patriarchal movement that includes women, children, um, and in a sense, I would argue also that religious minorities, the idea is to, that they're creating a kind of a hierarchical moral order in which a, a Muslim is better able to care both, uh, to both respect those above oneself and, and, and care for those below oneself. This is sort of the, the foundational basis, um, uh, foundational argument that they make. And Tablighi see this as a solution to growing ethnic and sectarian fragmentation and a way to create a pious Islamic state that is capable of creating well-being and managing conflict. But this requires first the creation of that genuine Islamic So an Islamic state requ requires the formation of a pious body of Muslims, and then Pakistan's problems, they believe, will be kind of resolved through this process. The least believe Islamic piety promoted through Dawah is the solution to, to the violence that afflicts the post-colonial Pakistan state. Um, as social scientists, of course, we should one should treat such claims with a healthy skepticism, since they do not necessarily address the underlying structural reasons for political violence and fragmentation. Nevertheless, such claims must be taken seriously, as they are a potent force for drawing Pakistani Muslims to the movement from across caste, ethnic, and class boundaries. Okay. So that's what I'm interested in, is how people from across these divisions come together in this movement to forge an Islamic unity that transcends what they take to be the foundational problems of the Pakistani state. Okay. Why is this interesting or why is this important? Well, there are a lot of reasons um, that a specialist of religion would be very interested in, in the ways that kind of different models of religion um, compete with each other in the public sphere. Um, so one of the things that is very important in the study of religion is religious revivalism that seems to be spreading across the world. Um, one of the sort of dominant paradigms in the social sciences, um, one that has enjoyed great currency also in policymaking circles, has been what we call modernization theory. In this framework, it was assumed that all societies pass through the same stages of development and religion would eventually recede in importance in societies that move up the sort of stages, uh, the ladder of development. In other words, societies would eventually become much more secularized, religion would have much less of a public role in life, um, people would, would, would Okay, so that, that's sort of the paradigm. But in recent decades, what we've seen throughout the world um, is that this is not the case. There have been religious revivalist movements across religious traditions as diverse as Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism. Some of these uh, religious revivalisms have been authoritarian or militant, while others have sought in traditional values a solution to some of the most pressing concerns of contemporary life from poverty and inequality to ecological crisis to domestic and political violence, et cetera, et cetera. And anthropologists of religion, including myself, have been carefully studying the diversity of such religious revival movements throughout the world. And to forge a comparison between them um, brings out really interesting things about, about modern life and why people are motivated to join in these revivalist practices. Um, when uh, it, it's really important in particular for Islam to understand the diversity of uh, contemporary Islamic movements. Um, when anthropologists, uh, oh, anthropologists always try to understand people's motivations uh, uh, and sort of try to understand what it is that people themselves believe they're doing in any kind of religious activity or any activity for that matter. Um, and what I've tried to show here is that uh, many Muslims are coming to the Tabligh Jamaat because they believe that Dawah and the forms of life that it engenders provide a solution to a range of social and political crises that they see around themselves, that afflict contemporary life and lives. Islam, they believe, provides a means for transcending such crises and creating a genuine moral community. And it is important to recognize that indeed many of the issues for which they, the Bligis find a solution in Islamic piety are 
also readily recognizable to many not to many other Pakistani Muslims and even to non-Muslims, not just in Pakistan but anywhere. The the types of violence and the types of of conflicts that the Bliz identify as a problem are indeed very much a problem for many other types of people, even if they won't accept their solution or their framing of the problem. Um, there's good reason to believe that then that, that our perspectives are not mutually exclusive necessarily, and that you know even though there's not going to be a total alignment uh, with the Tablighi perspective, there's still some basis for mutual understanding, and even potentially one might say common thoughts, right? We can try to understand from their perspective, what these problems are, from our own perspective, and 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 we may uh, learn something about the problems by examining their framing of the issue. Okay. This is particularly important in the contemporary world. Since 9-11, Islam has been readily linked um, to violence in Western representations. Um, Islamophobia, uh, uh, like Orientalism, constructs Muslims as the kind of other of Western civilization uh, and treats Islam and the West as if they're fundamentally mutually exclusive. Um, Islam is then in Islamophobic renderings identified with violence and violence is treated as if it is sort of an intrinsic propensity, in, intrinsic property of Islam. Um, and in, in many representations, this implies uh, that you see uh, in Western media, uh, implies that the more religiosity that a Muslim has, the more likely they are to have radical or militant dispositions. But what I have to show and what I've tried to show is that uh, is that the Muslims see Islam in exactly the opposite way, as something that mitigates or remedies um, the potential for violence that exists in Pakistan. And again, while one should have a kind of healthy skepticism, of the Bliqi understandings of the problem, it does c compel us to think more critically um, about the relationship between religion and violence in contemporary life. Thank you. Peace and light to you and yours. So, I, I, you know, I sometimes do this and do that.